Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see me all okay. Um, I'm Tim Robinson, and I'm Chief Operating Officer at Tech East. Um, and I'm very pleased to be the host and chair of this conference this morning. Um, I do hope you all uh, find it uh, very stimulating and hopefully both insightful uh, and uh, with some real sort of practical steps and guidance that you can take away to help you in your businesses. Um, first off, uh, just to say, uh, so Tech East, we're a tech business network and we're helping drive the region's digitally enabled economy. Uh, we're here today because we really wanted to bring together um, two industries, um, the tourism and visitor economy industry, uh, clearly um, experiencing uh, some real challenges in the context of COVID-19, um, but also you know, a huge uh, part of our region's economy. Um, and we have some uh, much more detail, I think, on, 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 how, on how the visitor economy is kind of the, the state of play and how things are shaping up. And that those will be um, coming through in, over the speakers in the morning. Um, but we're really here to help you, uh, we hope, uh, find new ways to restart and reboot using technology in the context of the pandemic. Um, as many of you all know, uh, this event was originally scheduled to take place on the 31st of March at Wells Maltings, uh, but we had to postpone it until later in the year as social distancing measures became the reality. But we then decided to bring forward our plans and run this as an online event. Uh, and uh, well, we hope that there won't be too many glitches with the platform. Uh, we've done uh, lots of uh, dry runs, uh, so hopefully you'll find it a smooth experience. But we've also had to make some changes to the original uh, agenda and lineup of speakers. Um, so uh, to those of uh, to, to those who are able to uh, join us today as speakers, you know, many thanks, and I'll introduce them shortly. I'd, I'd really like to thank a number of people on behalf of our four partners, the four partners being Norfolk County Council, Tech East, uh, New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership and Norfolk Chamber of Commerce. Um, thanks first to our fantastic speakers uh, drawn, drawn from a range of uh, either technology or digitally enabled businesses in the region, which are Staylists, Quickfire Digital, SafePoint and Big Drop. Plus we also have speakers from Visit East of England, uh, from Norfolk County Council and from New Anglia LEP. So a range of technology businesses, business support and uh, tourism sector organisations. I'm sure each is going to provide some really insightful pointers as to ways in which you as tourism businesses can use technology yourselves in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you especially to my co-organisers, Jen Fuller from Economic Development Team at Norfolk County Council and to Bridget Curran from Tech East and to others who've helped with the event production, so the team at Indigo Illusions, Danielle Casey and Cassie Barker-Jones. But most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for giving up your time today to participate in this event. We really hope that you'll get a lot out of it and we have some exciting plans for more events later in the year, uh, diving deeper into some specific topics. But before I hand over to our first speaker, just a few other housekeeping notes. As I mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on both Tech East website and the New Anglia LEP website. Uh, please do use the chat function for any general comments, questions, questions for speakers during their slots and at the end of their, um, and, and uh, also to introduce yourself. We'll, we'll be running a panel at 12 o'clock and you can ask questions to the panel using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We are going to be running a number of polls during the conference. So we've got some questionnaires and we're going to be running those uh, in the poll function. And we'd love your feedback on those. It will really help us shape uh, the event plan as we go forward and help overall with our planning around the uh, tourism uh, recovery plan, which we uh, will feed into New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership and to the County Council and to others. And finally, we'd love you to share what you hear and see on social media. Please do use the hashtag tourism tech. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Graham Plant, who is Deputy Leader at Norfolk County Council and is our first speaker this morning. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us at this inaugural tourism and tech webinar. We have worked together with Tech East, the New Anglia LEP 
and Norfolk Chambers of Commerce to bring you this event today, which demonstrates how doing more with digital can support your tourism business to recover and grow. So prepare to be inspired. The coronavirus has had a huge impact for many over the last few months, and we express our deepest sympathy to those who have been affected. The tourism sector has been particularly hard hit, and supporting it to recover is a key priority for the Council. Indeed, supporting the visitor economy has always been a priority for us and our partners. And whilst we had originally planned to hold this event in the spring, it is now more relevant than ever for us to be here today. I would also like to take this opportunity to mention another project aimed at helping your business to grow called Experience. This is led by Norfolk County Council and co-funded by the European Regional Development Fund and involves six regions in England and France. The aim for Norfolk is to boost the numbers of visitors here in the off-peak season between October and March by creating experiences that are unique to our county. Participants will be able to make connections and highlight any skills or tools that would help them bounce back and thrive post coronavirus, as well as feeding into ideas and project for Norfolk experiences. It is an exciting project and will help to attract more visitors here out of season. The use of digital technology will be integral to this. As the use of digital technology to do business grows, there has never been a more pressing need to inspire businesses across Norfolk and Suffolk to embrace it, to innovate, cooperate, work more efficiently and be more creative. It is my belief that digital technology can drive positive change and help your tourism business to not only recover, but to be stronger and more resilient in the future. Today, we have curated a lineup of high caliber speakers for you, who will be talking about the benefits that technology can bring. Led by Tim Robinson of Tech East, you will hear inspiring insights from business leaders and experts such as Adrian Melrose from Staylists, Callum Coombs from SafePoint, Nathan Lomax from Quickfire Digital, and James Kindred from Big Drop Brewery. They have either used digital tools to build their own successful businesses or have helped others to do the same. We are also delighted to welcome Pete Waters from Visit East of England and Jason Middleton from New Anglia LEP to talk about the wider sector work being done to support recovery. We will be running a series of polls throughout the event to get your feedback on all those digital on all things digital. So please do take a minute or so to answer these. This will be used to develop future sessions and take a deep dive into specific technology so that we can provide further support to you. We will also finish with the opportunity to ask our panel of experts any questions you might have about the tech discussed today and how it can help you. Thank you everyone and I hope you leave today feeling inspired to find out more. And I'm delighted that we have Pete Wells, Chief Executive of Visit East of England. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for the invitation to uh, to come today and, and talk to you all. Um, fantastic turnout. Um, I'm presuming there's a lot there's a lot of rain outside, so um, we can't go down the beaches at the moment. Um, so yeah, thanks for the um, for the the invite to, to come and talk today. I'll give an over overview on the visitor economy. Um, specifically, I'll talk about some of our challenges that we've had in in recent years. Um, I'll then go on to talk about the recovery plan that we're working on with all the local authorities. Uh, the DMOs and New Anglia LEP, um, but it is very fast moving at the moment. Um, so what I've also done is added in some details uh, from Visit Britain activity that I hope will be of interest to this audience. Okay, so um, who are they? just a quick overview on us, who are we? We, uh, we were Visit East Anglia, we were set up in 2012 when the regional development agencies uh, were abolished. Um, uh, it's a private sector business set up by uh, various visitor attractions and other hospitality uh, businesses in uh, in the east of England. Um, at, the, at the time, uh, it wasn't really representing um, the region at a national level. It was very much about looking after the contracts to run Visit Norfolk and Visit Suffolk since we've been uh, that we've been doing since uh, 2012. Uh, as I say, we work with all the DMOs um, in the two two counties and the and the local authorities. Um, but I'll, I'll explain in a, in, a, in a few minutes about why we've changed to visit East of England. Um, but suffice to say that we are actually now the visitor economy sector group for New Anglia LEP. Um, so we're making progress. Um, in terms of tourism itself, 
combined value in the two counties, 5.4 billion pounds. Now, Norfolk alone is 3.3 billion, and uh, you might be surprised uh, to know that uh, Cornwall's is actually around about 2 billion. So Norfolk's uh, visitor economy far, far exceeds that of Cornwall. Um, across the four counties, including Essex and Cambridgeshire, it's actually 10 billion pounds a year. Um, and that's uh, uh, larger than Yorkshire with its you know, very large cities and two national parks. So um, it's the largest industry sector here in the east of England, and it's the largest employer across the, the four counties. It employs around about a quarter of a million people. Um, and in terms of its importance, um, Graham touched upon it a little while ago. If you think about somewhere like Great Yarmouth, that is 40, uh, uh, the visitor economy there is 40% of all employment. Okay, so hugely, hugely important uh, sector to the east of England. Um, in terms of our challenges, this is really what we've been working on the last couple of years. So there's a poor perception of the industry that it's low paid, low skilled and seasonal. Um, I mean, like it or not, I mean, that, that, that is just the perception. You know, people tend to think of it as a as uh, something they'll do before they get themselves a proper job or you know waiting on tables and that kind of thing it's it's a it's a perception issue that we have and we really desperately need to change that that narrative um in terms of productivity well clearly today with digital innovation that's what we're about here um we're looking to um creative ideas to improve productivity and of course what we want to do is have is have a year-round visitor economy um, a lot of my colleagues in the past have said, well, we're, we're 12 weeks of the year. No, we're not. We're 12 months of the year. And we need to stop talking about the season because it should be 12 months of the year. And if I'm honest, we need to be talking not so much about tourism, but about the visitor economy, because that's what this is all about. It's, an employ it's about employment. It's about building businesses. Um, it's about wealth creation. It's about innovation. Um, in terms of... Uh, the database that we operate, we, we um, inherited that when the East of England uh, Tourism Board, as I went pop in 2012, uh, but that, and that was constantly being updated by tourism information centres. They, they were very much our eyes and ears on the ground, and, and sadly, many of those have closed over the years. So a big challenge for us is, is, is uh, creating a new database that is relevant and fit for purpose. Um, in terms of the sector can't communicate with itself, well, if we don't have a database of businesses, Clearly, we can't communicate with them, they can't communicate with us. The, the, this is a really interesting one for us, and I'm, I'm sure Adrian will, will uh, well, he won't touch upon it. This, this will be very much what he'll, he'll be talking about later. It's a real bugbear with us, a real bone of contention that online travel agents, uh, the OTAs, the, the, the booking.coms of this world, they're the biggest advertisers on Google, and frankly, they hoover up money and they take it not just out of our local economy, but out of our national economy as well. Um, so they were the disruptors. Um, and I think uh, working with Adrian, as we'll, as we'll explain a little later, and others, we hope to disrupt them a little bit back. Um, region isn't top of mind with Visit Britain. Uh, and I touched upon that a little while ago. Um, we went off the radar a few years ago, uh, as I said, when the East of England Tourism Board, uh, the demise of that. And we really didn't um, engage at a national level. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll come, come back to that in, in a second. We're not top of mind with consumers, despite the fact that tourism industry, this, the visitor economy is worth over five billion pounds here in uh, Norfolk and Suffolk, 10 billion across the, across the region. We're not top of mind with consumers. Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, um, the Lakes, the Peaks, Wales, Scotland, you know, you could go on and on and on. We're not top of mind. And yet it's worth over five billion pounds a year. So if we were top of mind, just imagine what we could do. And in terms of working together, um, as I said, well, what's the alternative, particularly um, in the current situation? Um, we're watching other regions get ahead of us. Well we, well, we can't let that continue. And the only way that we will um, earn our fair share at the national level is by working together. Okay, have I forgotten any challenges? Ah, yes. Tourism was buoyant here in the east of England. Uh, to give you an example of that, since 2012, the visitor economy of Norfolk alone 
has, um, has gone up by 14% nationally across England, but it's gone up 8%. So Norfolk was actually doing better than the rest of the country. Suffolk was on a par. Um, of course, since March 22nd, we've been pushing the message now is not the time for tourism. You know, there has been no tourism at all um, since March 22nd. I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on the impact of COVID-19 on, on the industry. Graham has already um, uh, suggested, you know, that, that it's, it's devastating at the moment. It could be catastrophic if it continues into the autumn. And that's one of the, one of the really important things about this, with us saying now is not the time for tourism. Clearly, we're now going to go through a transition period where people can travel again. Um, we're looking forward to hopefully self-catering accommodation, broad cruises, serviced accommodation opening up soon. And obviously, we're, we're hoping for that um, July 4th date of hospitality businesses opening. Um, we had a bit of a bombshell on, on Friday with a conference call with Visit Britain um, when uh, they suggested that the July 4th date is not in, uh, set in stone. The government will actually review the data on June the 29th and then make a decision about whether hospitality businesses can open on July the 4th. Clearly, we cannot afford a second spike. If that happens and we go back, back into lo uh, to, um, lockdown, there will be no tourism in 2020. And that's why it's very, very important that while we want to um, gradually bring back visitors to the east of England, clearly we don't want it to happen too quickly and risk a second outbreak and another lockdown. Uh, as I said, that would be absolutely catastrophic for the industry. So we have to be very, very um, clear um, about how we um, bring back tourism. In terms of sector skills, it's really, really important. Of course, digital um, innovation plays a large part in this. Uh, we're working with New Anglia and stakeholders, we have a skills plan in place. Clearly, a way of um, developing uh, investment, upskilling and training is by having that year-round visitor economy. Um, so, as I said earlier, we want to rewrite the narrative. There are fantastic careers to be had in uh, this sector. Um, the lady in the bottom right um, is actually the Chief Operating Officer at Adnams, a lady called Karen Hester. She actually started at Adnams as a cleaner 20 years ago. She's now the Chief Operating Officer. Um, uh, two uh, photographs above her is a gentleman called Jake Fines. He's a conservation manager at Holcomb. Uh, you'll probably know his famous brothers and uh, explorer uncle. And, and there is just a, just a, a snapshot of, uh, of some of the jobs that are available in uh, this sector. As I said, it's not just waiting tables, um, albeit, you know, of course, in France, that is a fantastic profession. But we want to bring youngsters through. We want to reintegrate maybe retired people, um, people who have, who have um, maybe lost their jobs um, in this uh, pandemic. So there's, there's lots of opportunities to be had in this sector. In terms of touching some of those other challenges, we've now got a new Visit East of England website. Um, we're offering free listings for every business on there. And the reason uh, for that is, as I said earlier, if, every, if we have every tourism related business and service on that database, we can talk to them, they can talk to us, we can then take um, our messages to a national level. I'm sure Adrian will talk about the next point um, in more detail later. We have a free booking mechanic with um, Staylist. So accommodation providers can come with us um, uh, with a free booking mechanic. It works in real time. Um, and the thing about uh, what we're doing is we're only charging 10% commission for hotels, unlike the OTAs. As I said earlier, uh, they hoover up money, they charge 15 to 30% commission, and they take that money out of the local economy. What we're saying is come with us, um, have your free booking mechanic with, uh, with stay lists. We'll only charge 10% commission, but you know that 100% of the value of any booking stays within the local um, economy. Um, what we're also doing is creating bookable itineraries. Um, and uh, as I said, we're building the skills hub uh, as part of the skills plan. And uh, if you go on the website, you will find that there is a daily update um, from the Tourism Industry Emergency Response Group and Government talking about um, the latest measure, uh, measures uh, from organisations ranging from the, the government itself to UK hospitality. As I said, we're, we're not top of mind, so we've reinvented ourselves as Visit East of England. Um, I got tired of seeing 
uh, the usual suspects, uh, Cornwall, Kent, the Lakes, etc., hoovering up money um, from uh, government initi initiatives like the Discover England Fund. Um, and when I approached Visit Britain, Visit England to talk about you know, why we weren't being represented, they said, well, the thing is, Pete, we just get white noise out of, out of your region. Um, we have so many competing voices, we don't know who to talk to. So it was at that point that we realized, let's have a, a step change, let's, let's remove the Visit East Anglia, let's park that, reinvent ourselves as Visit East of England, set ourselves up as the sector group with the LEP, and uh, create a, a, a much better working uh, relationship with all the local authorities, the DMOs, so that we can take a collective voice to government. And I think we've, we've done some really good work in the last year or so. Uh, we held a digital workshop for the destination marketing organizations in Bury St. Edmunds uh, late last year. Um, that was one of only three that Visit England did um, in the whole country. So we were uh, very lucky to get that, but we only got it because Visit Britain, Visit England can now see that we're working together here in the east of England. Um, sector deals and tourism zones, uh, really, really important. Um, I don't know if you remember last June, the government announced a sector deal for the visitor economy. And as part of that, they suggested that there may be five tourism zones across the country. Clearly, all our work at the moment is about bidding for a tourism zone here in the east of England. It would bring um, millions of pounds of investment um, from government, um, and it would give us an opportunity, as I say, to drive what is already a five billion pound industry um, e e even better. And clearly there's going to be an, e an economic impact of coronavirus. So um, tourism, uh, having a tourism zone here in the east of England, um, it, it's gonna be vitally important for us to progress in the future. As I said, I'll just touch upon a couple of things that Visit Britain um, are up to. They've got a consumer survey running. It started uh, on, uh, it's been published since June the 1st. It started um, mid-May. Uh, worryingly, I won't run through these, but my last point here, in terms of uh, 10 regions in the country, where do visitors, or where, do, where do people think that they will travel to um, from now until September, and then from October onwards, of the top 10 regions, um, where do you think they, they all want to travel to? They want to go to the southwest. They want to go to the honey pots uh, of uh, Devon, Dorset, and Cornwall. Where is the east of England? On the uh, on the on, on one of the uh, categories, we're we're bottom, and on the other one, we're a third from bottom. So again, a lot of work to do. Some of you may have heard about the the uh, Visit Britain Industry Standard. Um, it's it's going to be called We're Good to Go. Um, and it will be a, um, a self-assessment online uh, questionnaire, and anybody who any business who passes that will be given um, or will be able to use the branding. We're good to go. Um, they're hoping that number ten will sign that off this week, uh, and then the DMOs and ourselves can start promoting that hopefully uh, next week. Before that, uh, Visit Britain will also be launching a No Before You Go campaign. Um, which we will be uh, echoing as well. Um, and what that's about is before people travel, make sure you do your homework. If you're going to a visitor attraction, uh, go on their website, make sure um, that one, it's open, but also is online booking um, uh, with managed timetables so that the businesses can um, manage their footfall effectively. So we'll, we'll be very much supporting that. And likewise, we'll, we'll be cascading all this information out as, as we get it. Again, it comes back to this working together as a region. The coronavirus pandemic is uh, devastating for the, uh, the industry here in the east of England, but only by working together can we see ourselves through that. And as part of that, um, we recently did um, a business, tourism business survey, 776 businesses uh, responded to that. We got some really very, very good data in terms of what we needed to do, but also in terms of a lobbying tool that we've taken to FaZe, uh, to DCMS and other government organizations. We've been lobbying the tourism minister and our, our own MPs as well. And I'm glad to say that with the work that we've been doing, working with all our stakeholders and also many other uh, tourism organizations and bodies um, around the country, a lot of that, that lobbying work has succeeded. In terms of the recovery plan, Clearly what we're trying to do is, is, is create an umbrella framework that all stakeholders can work 
under um, because all the districts have their own individual needs um, and, and, and issues. Uh, for instance, um, obviously seasonal tourism in Great Yarmouth with the visitor attractions on the seafront, self-catering accommodation, I'm generalizing here in North Norfolk on the Suffolk coast, clearly retail in places like Norwich, Ipswich, um, Bury St Edmunds. So they, everyone has their own issues, um, but the important thing is that recovery plan, as I say, creates an umbrella that we can all work within, share ideas, um, share initiatives, uh, come up with best practices that we can that we can work together on and then as i said that will lead to uh, later uh, a bid to become a tourism zone here um something we're working on at the moment is unexplored england that um we'll, we'll do across norfolk and suffolk it'll be a companion piece to the tourism recovery plan um it's very much a reassurance campaign it's about um inviting visitors back here to the region when it is safe for them to visit when it's safe for residents and when it's safe for businesses and their staff. Um, as I said, if we get a second spike, then uh, we're done for tourism uh, this year. We, that's the last thing that we want. Um, it will be a staged approach. Um, we, it's a, we're talking about three stages here, early recovery. So we, what we'll be saying to, to potential visitors is plan your visit, look at all the great things that we have to offer here. Then uh, working on reassurance, so travel only when it's safe. And then the really important thing is start building demand for later year and 2020. So just coming to a, a conclusion, um, I do genuinely believe that there's a massive opportunity for us. As I say it's devastating what's happened. Tourism industry was doing incredibly well before this, and we will do well again coming out of it. As I said, if we work collectively, if we work, work with you guys for digital innovation, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and boy. Do we need that now? We need innovation. We need creativity. So um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of this morning. And uh, I look very much forward to working with you in the future. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Adrian Melrose, who is the founder and CEO of Staylists um, and who is our next speaker. Um, Adrian, uh, we are, we, we, we'd, we'd love to hand over to you right now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Um, great to, to see you again, Pete. It's been a while, although we've been working together. A um, little bit of introduction. Um, you'll see two logos on, on, the, on the screen, um, Staylists and InStyle. Um, they are owned by the same. We have a platform called Staylists, which really sits on top of what's called a property management system. And for those of you who don't know what a PMS is, well, that's a property management system. And, and our journey as a company started about 10 years ago when we started with InStyle. And InStyle was, it's really just a glorified diary, which enables properties um, to, to know how many rooms they've got um, and uh, you know, rates and availability. So we can push those because if we don't know the real truth of, of, of availability and rates, we can't do this thing online. And so InStyle grew to a point where um, we, we now have about a thousand users, um, small accommodation owners um, in the UK. And it grew to, um, well, it grew into um, a platform called Staylists. And, and that really um, started, and I actually need to start my um, 15 minutes a bit late here because um, I could talk forever on this stuff. But um, Staylists um, started when um, a small visit, um, well, it was a, a small um, a tourist information center in in the lake district came to us and said well you know if you can if you if we can get everybody to use in style maybe we could um potentially um build build a booking platform on it um and that's where stalis was born so stalis doesn't just sit on in style it sits on many of our um our peers in the market like super control um, anything that's uh, built on sitebinder so when we um we started talking to pete um with uh, with vee um, a good year and a year and a half ago, I think now, um, it was a wonderful opportunity <clears throat> to not only bring the InStyle users onto this platform, but also the Super Control users, all the little hotel hoteliers. So our, our accommodation investment or the investment has been in integrating with other people as well. And and of course, technology is a fragmented thing. That the ecosystem, especially in travel, is 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 very fragmented. So um, our challenge is to try and bring everybody together. Um, and to help um, dis disintermediate the, the big players like Booking.com. So um, I'm going to pitch this 
from an install point of view, doesn't necessarily mean that um, you have to use install because most property management systems should do what, what, what we do. Um, and uh, and install and stay lists um, are, are interconnected. So hopefully we will help you distribute um, in, a, in a fairer economy um, and keep, as, as Pete said, all the margin in, in, the, um, in the local economy. So let's kick off. Let me just see if I, all right. So I just wanted to talk about using technology to take back control. Um, and then really three, three main themes, helping you to increase your cash flow, um, inspiring your consumer confidence, and then um, moving on to, to keeping the overall costs low. So what are the pain points? Well, I'm hoping everybody's accepted that the telephone no longer works um, and that the guests are driving the market and they want instant online booking. That's why they go to the likes of Airbnb or booking.com. So if you don't have a property management system at the, at the base level of your technology, if you're an accommodation owner or in, in, in hospitality, you can't sell online. And if you can't sell online, you can't rely on people playing telephone tag. So it's really time, if you haven't, to adopt a PMS that can, that can support you in everything I'm going to talk about in the next um, 10 minutes. Right, um, the next pain point, obviously, um, uh, Pete alluded to this, is the online travel agents are, 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 have got a stranglehold on the economy. Um, and they, try, you know, they charge most of your margin, actually. Um, so high commissions. Um, and uh, so, so really, the, you, you have an opportunity. I always say direct is best. Sell directly on your own website. But it's quite difficult for that website to be found. So you need a you need a, um, a strategy where you partner with organizations like VEE um, so that you can be found. Um, and then if you can't sell directly, distribute sensibly, take it to an endpoint that's not gonna rip you off with an 18 to 25% um, commission rate. The next pain point, well, guest abandon, if a guest abandons your website, they just, you know, they might discover, they might get inspired by you. They might be looking at your Instagram feed they might be absolutely inspired um, to come and visit you and book there, but actually they go to your website and it's lackluster. And I think Nathan, I'm, I'm guessing what Nathan's going to talk to, to us in the next session about, but Nathan is the guy I'm sure who will build you um, a, a, a beautiful website um, that doesn't um, result in guests um, jumping off and going somewhere else. So as long as you've got a good PMS that's embedded in one of Nathan's websites, um, you'll find that um, that people won't abandon and jump off because that costs you a lot of money. You you put all this effort into Instagram, driving people to your website, and then they they jump off and go and book on on Booking.com, and cost you eighteen percent. So you almost double taxed. The other pay pay point, um, OTAs look after their audience, not you. I mean, they they need you as the property because that's the, that's what they're selling. But you you would have probably seen just how. Booking.com and Airbnb have turned their backs on many um, non-refundable rates. And, and I know a lot of our users have been furious that what they thought was money in their bank was refunded by um, Booking.com. So just be careful. And I think I say later on, don't put all your eggs in, in one basket. If you, if you love Airbnb, it is, it, is, it is a wonderful experience. It's very easy to use. But don't put all your eggs in, in Airbnb's basket. Make sure that you have control right at the source and have your own property management system. You can distribute to multiple places, but really you should start using the online travel agents as glorified search engines because most, most guests will come back looking for your own website. And if they, they see your website and they have a painless, easy to use booking experience, they will book directly with you. And that's the whole, that's the whole, um, name of the game here. So yeah, don't place all your eggs in, a, in, in the OTA's baskets. Take back control using a capable prop property management system and then distribute sensibly, um, which is, uh, which is uh, certainly the opportunity. So um, let, let, let's talk about bounce back basics. Um, any booking outside your cancellation terms is basically provisional. So if you've got a 24-hour cancellation policy, you can't really bank on that booking until that 24 hour uh, window um, comes up. So what you really need to do is we've just got to get everybody out there thinking EasyJet. Make prepaid the norm. Um, and so um, 
one of the things that we certainly have done at InStyle in the last few months is we've we've really invested heavily in in vouchers because if you if you give a guest um, a preferential rate and you you say it is non-refundable, that may put a guest off, but it is going to be the best rate. And if you get the best rate, and then you say to a guest, you know what, if you want the flexibility, we'll swap that out with a gift voucher so that you can book at any other time. And, and actually what's happened is, you know, any, any property with a good prop property management system has been able to swap up cancellations with discounts in an automated style. So you really need to make sure your property management system does this because gift vouchers are the way to offer non-refundable flexibility which is the best of both worlds. The next thing is flexibility is a premium. You, 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 we need to try and change the world. So it, we should, there should be a gap of 20%. The, the airlines did it, we've accepted it, and, um, and flexibility should be premium. Um, bank your best rate. Um, you've just got to take all the friction out of the, of the booking process don't have a complex rate structure where a guest gets into your, um, your website and there are nine different types of, well, there's a rate including breakfast. There's a rate if you don't do this, if you don't do that. I mean, it's, it's really complicated. Try and create, and we've always tried to get our users to look at selling a hotel room as a product. People just want to know what it is and what it costs. They don't want 16 different derivations of, of the product. And you probably find they get so confused that they, um, they abandoned, uh, abandon and go to somewhere where it is, it's simpler. So just take the friction out. Um, upsell your options, that's an, a no brainer. If you can try and um, get some more money out of them at the, at, at the time of booking. Um, offer them incentives. Um, and then of course, um, your call to action on social media, CTA, was, should always be go book. It should be taken to a booking page. Try and give them a promo link where the, the promotion is priced into that landing page. So they don't go to your, your home page and go and have to dig around looking for the promotion link. Make sure that you are sending them straight to a landing page with the product you're selling. So an example of this, if you've got a Sunday afternoon, um, a Sunday night rate, take them to a page which is which is selling them the Sunday rate. Don't expect them to go digging and, and searching in your, your, your internet booking engine for that rate. So consumer confidence, um, all about converting looks to books. So um, looks to books ratio is something we talk about a lot. Um, think like a customer. So keep, uh, and it's just reinforcing this, keep the booking journey clear and simple. Keep the pricing transparent. Um, often the pricing of, of our clients that we, we inherit um, who've just adopted PMSs or come from a different PMS is a really complicated pricing structure. We, we use base rates and we build those um, uh, from there. So, so if you change your base rate, your breakfast rate will change automatically or, or whatever it might be. Um, so don't give any, don't get your customers any reason to leave your site. It's just, um, it's just not worth it. So just keep it simple because if they do leave your site, they're either going to go and book at a competitor or they're going to book on, on booking.com and cost you 18%. Um, obviously motivate the booking um, and, um, and offer a gift voucher guarantee. So if prepaid rates, and this is the point I made early in the slide, in the slide before, um, offer them a gift voucher guarantee. So, you know, ask them for prepaid paid rates, bank that money, you won't have to refund that money to them, so you can use it to, um, to finance your business, um, but um, ensure that they've got a, a gift voucher guarantee. So if they do have a change in circumstance, they don't get their cash back, but you don't, you know, you don't have to give the cash back, um, but at least they get to, to, to stay in the future. And that's really important, in, in, especially in the sort of COVID-19 time. <clears throat> Secret codes. Just make sure that when your, 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 your guests leave, you've given them a secret code with a, with a 10% um, uh, discount the next time they come to incentivize them booking again with you directly. Um, and make sure that you know who they are, make sure that your PMS has an element of recognizing them when they come back and those voucher codes um, can be automated in your PMS. Lower costs, um, we've always said, um, 
you know, 50, well, the, not we have, it's industry stati statistic that 53% of OTA customers will always try and look at to see if you have a website of your own before booking. So if they're looking, make sure they book, convert the looks to books. Um, one rate to the OTAs, don't get a complicated rate structure and send all of those rates to the OTAs. Have one rate to the OTAs and then, um, and then use your flexible rates on your, your own, uh, own sites. Um, Build partnerships locally for, for marketing. Um, obvious, the obvious one is build a partnership with VEE. Um, they are your marketing partner in the region. Um, and then um, reach out to the rest of, of the partners there. Um, and again, promote, um, promote booking directly. Um, returning guests, um, I, I've, I've spoken about that. that you know, they, they, are, they are sitting ducks in your marketing database. Please go back to them and offer them um, you know, um, an incentive to book again. Um, and secret unlock codes. Uh, your PMS should be able to do that for you. Um, web only rates, um, you know, the telephone, the te you might have a lot of people phoning you in um, for, uh, to make bookings, but try and, and, and get people using your internet booking engine. Um, that's why you have to have a really slick one um, because it saves time and um, answering telephones to say you're fully booked um, is just a waste of everybody's time. Um, your payment providers, this is another area. We have partnered with some amazing payment providers and, and saving a, an absolute fortune on, on um, card payments and so on. And, and these are becoming really important because the, one of the biggest things we've had to do in the last um, few, um, few weeks is prepare for contactless check-in and check-out. So um, we need cards on file. Your PMS should take a card on file, should be in, uh, emailing a, a, an arriving guest 24 hours before arrival saying, hey, check in, put your card on file so that when you arrive, all you have to do is pick up the key at the, the desk. You don't have to do anything else. Um, and, uh, and then also you can check out um, on the card online on your phone. So that's really important. And we've been very busy engineering all of that. Um, and again, gift vouchers, sell your gift vouchers or refund the gift vouchers with, uh, with, with well, we, we, we released this in the last few months just to, to power all the cancellations we were seeing. So that's really, I think I probably hopefully stuck in uh, within my time, time limit. Pleasure to, to, to be uh, presenting today um, and I'll be on the panel later and um, here are my uh, uh, contact details. So please do um, drop me an email and ask me any questions. I'm here to help. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to embrace digital um, and, uh, and good luck with the reopening. I hope it is the 4th of July. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased now to introduce uh, Nathan Lomax from Quickfire Digital. Hi, Nathan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, again, another local technology business, this time based in Norfolk, and I'm now handing over to Nathan to take us through um, the, uh, well, uh, how, to, how to use this, uh, how to escape this crisis. What's your escape vehicle? It's digital. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by just very quickly saying in the next 15 minutes is my opportunity to serve, not sell. If you'd like to find out about me, if you'd like to find out about my business, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and we can have a conversation. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about your getaway vehicle from COVID-19. There's a famous saying that says, if you want to be in the top 1%, you have to do what the other 99% of businesses and people are not prepared to do. Some of the things I say today, you may not like, but I'm prepared to call you out. I believe that as business owners, it's time to control the controllables and to look inwardly first. There is no doubt that the coronavirus has had a massive impact on all of your businesses. However, there is an opportunity for us to invest in ourselves, to invest in our businesses, and to make sure that when we come out of this, we're putting the best foot forwards. You'll be delighted to hear that the game has changed, but the opportunity has never been greater. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about digital transformation and how that can really propel your business as we come out of lockdown. So I want to start by asking you this, just how vulnerable is your business? How well do you know your ideal customer profile? Do you know where they live? Do you know how they spend online? Do you know how they behave? Do you know their gender? Do you have access to all of the right data? And for me, I see this all the time. Too many businesses have analytics set up, they've got done all the hard work, yet they don't use the data. So do you have access to the data 
And if not, why not? There is no longer an excuse to not have the data that you need. The next thing I would ask is around the frequency of communication. It's not good enough to go quiet during the pandemic. You will be judged as a business by how you respond and how you react. Your customers are still there. Yes, they might not be booking. Yes, they might not be eating with you or staying with you or visiting. But at the same time, they are still in existence and you can still communicate with them. We're going to touch upon your proposition. Does your proposition still solve the customer's problem or pain point? Or actually have times moved on and do you need to pivot? Do you have the right people in the right seats? This is important for all of us. As we come out of lockdown, perhaps we do need to change. Perhaps this is the best opportunity we will have to review our business, to have a real deep dive and say, actually, you know what? This person isn't right. And most importantly, have you got a digital roadmap in place? It is no longer acceptable to just fly by the seat of your pants and make decisions on the fly. It's time for us to set up a roadmap and make sure that we come out of COVID-19 fighting. So I ask you this, if you're unsure or that you feel you don't know the answer to any of these, it's time for you to take the next digital leap forwards. So today we're gonna to ask, are you in your business prepared to embrace digital transformation? For some of you, the answer may be yes. For some of you, you may be unsure. But hopefully in the next 15 minutes, I can share with you a few ways in which your business can start undertaking digital transformation. We're gonna start with mobile first experiences. Can people book your experience, your attraction, your hotel, your restaurant, the list goes on, on their mobile phone? Can they place an order? Can they plan a visit? Can they engage with your experience? Mobile has never been more important. And it's our job to take people on the journey from the second they arrive to the second they leave. And you take them from an ambassador through to an advocate and ensure that they return time and time again. This is all possible through mobile. I've touched upon this earlier, but I can't stress the importance enough of data. You may be familiar with this screen. This is within Google Analytics. Without having access to the client data, how can we possibly make informed decisions? And when it comes to digital transformation, how do we know where to best spend my, our time? This afternoon, I'm talking around the 80-20 principle and actually how can we invest 80% of our budget on the 20% that actually works for us rather than the spray and pray methodology that I've seen all too familiar. I'm really keen to see how can we understand our audience so that not only can we serve them better, but how can we make sure that we're finding lookalike audiences that match the audience we already have. Personalization is huge. And the things we do around e-commerce apply in tourism too. How can we make the customer feel special? How can you feel like they're the only person that exists and you're talking to them directly? So think about this. How can you segment your data? How can you target people? And how can you get the right message to the right person at the right time? I talk a lot when I'm speaking around evergreen sequences and funnels. It's no longer good enough for us just to send one email and leave it there. Everything we do or should do should be within a process or a sequence. What happens if someone doesn't reply? What happens if someone doesn't open? What happens if someone doesn't return our call? Everything forms part of a bigger picture and we need to map that out. For example, you send an email notifying them that you're reopening. 30% don't open. We then go back to those people and send them another email. We then go back again and maybe we change our tact of communication. Just because email may be comfortable for you, it doesn't mean it's comfortable for your customers. Think about how you can go offline. In a world where email is saturated and everybody is bombarded now, how about we pivot? How about we change and how about we stand up from the crowd? So think about, can we use SMS messaging? Can we use WhatsApp broadcast? Can we possibly just pick up the phone? Can we send letters? There are so many opportunities for us, but we need to start thinking proactively and not following the crowd. Reputation management is huge, and I'm sure the bane of your life for many will be something like TripAdvisor. It's no longer good enough to point the finger and blame TripAdvisor for any problems. We, as business owners, have a responsibility to maintain reputation and to communicate with our audience. 
it's time for us to stop operating this herd mentality and time for us to start adopting digital transformation. I always talk about surprise and delight. How can you surprise and delight your customers? Let's take a hotel as example. You turn up, you check in, everything's as expected. You go to the room, but instead of a stuffy old welcome pack that you've seen time and time again, you have a personal letter on the bed. It's got your name on it, it's handwritten, and it just welcomes you to the property. It invites you for a welcome drink, and it's all on the house. How does that make you feel? I would guess pretty good. It's really important when we're surprising and delighting, we're tapping into customers' emotions. When we're marketing, a lot of it is around emotion. After all, people buy on emotion and they're justified by logic. So how as business owners can we continue to surprise and delight our audience to make sure we become memorable? Because with the volume of opportunities online, with the vast array of competition, if we don't surprise and delight, if we don't go above and beyond, and if we just stay basic and we stay simplified and we don't experiment and we don't push the boundaries, then guess what? Your audience will go elsewhere because someone else will want your customer more. So I encourage you all to think about mechanisms and ways in which you can surprise and delight your audience time and time again. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Digital transformation isn't just for your customer base. It's not just to bring in new business. There is a massive opportunity to sit down and map out your internal processes and procedures. How can we make sure that housekeeping is done properly? How can we make sure that the onboarding process is different? What can we do with staff and, and recruitment? There are so many opportunities to use technology and we really need to sit down with a blank piece of paper and work through the business from top to bottom, internally and externally. I'm a huge advocate of marginal gains and for any of you who know me know where I love my sports and when you look at the Sydney Olympics and you look at the British rowing team or you look at the cycling team more recently and you look at someone like Sir Dave Brailsford you will see the concept of marginal gains. Digital transformation won't happen overnight. There is no magic wand. However you can make small and incremental changes that will make a huge amount of difference going forwards. I always encourage all of our clients to keep a positive evolution diary. I use evolution more than change because change has a fear factor among our customers and among anyone I talk to. So think about how you can keep a positive evolution diary that tracks and measures your marginal gains and your journey of digital transformation. For example, day one, we did this. Day two, we tried this, it worked brilliantly. Day three, we tried this and it was a disaster. But actually, we've learned so much from that, we know what to do next time for day four and day five. Surrounding yourself with the right people has never been more important. I'm a huge advocate of specialists rather than generalists. It's no longer good enough to try and do everything yourself. We simply can't do it. It's really important you surround yourself with those that know more. And it's okay. Hold your hands up, admit you don't know everything, and get the help that you need. For me, there's been various mentors in our business that have helped us get to where we would like to get to, and I still work with them to this day. But for you, I encourage you all to find people that can help you. It might be myself. It might be other speakers today. It might be other panelists. It might be other delegates. It's really important that you stop trying to do this journey alone. Building strategic partnerships, I believe, is where our biggest opportunity is right now. There are over 150 people on this call, all with some fantastic businesses. And actually, if we look a little bit more laterally, we can start to see the opportunity to work together. There is a massive opportunity to bring tourism back to Norfolk and to make sure that we come out of this virus fighting. So I leave you with this. It's time for us to take some responsibility and to make a difference. Don't be a green pod. Don't follow the crowd. Be the orange pea and stand out. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I'm very pleased to um, be able to introduce uh, Callum Coombs. I'm the, the CEO of SafePoint um, and my presentation today really is on the broad topic of safety uh, with some insights into safety specifically in the, the visitor economy. Um, just to give you a little intro about SafePoint, who we are and what we do, as Tim said, we, we started at a startup competition back in 2017 and, and since then it's really grown from strength to strength. 
uh, what we do is we solve the big problem of staff and safety, uh, staff safety and well-being, as well as business regulatory compliance, having all of these you know, loan workers out in the field. Uh, and we do that with a web, mobile and hardware tool that, that really protects staff that work on their own uh, and ticks all those compliance, compliance boxes. So when Tim emailed to ask me if I'd, I'd talk on the topic of safety in the, the visitor economy, initially, I'll be honest, I googled the visitor economy to see what the actual uh, definition of that is. Uh, because at SafePoint, we're, a, we're an industry agnostic platform. Uh, we see and learn all of these new sector descriptors every single day. Uh, and this was one where I wasn't entirely sure what was included in the kind of umbrella of visitor economy. And after having a little dig round, I found this picture here, uh, which really brilliantly explained it and well for me really broke down all of the, the sectors that are in there and it's great to see that at safe point we already support a lot of these businesses that are very much focused in the visitor economy whether that's protecting business travelers themselves so we protect staff that travel from places like the uk to, to the middle east and, and in sri lanka and things like that um, all the way through to uh, people that manage properties uh, and contractors maintaining and, and building this visitor in infrastructure so it's great to see that we were already very much um, working with all of these businesses. And that kind of took me on to the question of, you know, what should I talk about? Uh, we're, we're working with these businesses. I could, I could go through all the kind of reg regulations for loan working, but you know, that's always a little bit dry. I could run a demo of SafePoint, but that's all a bit salesy. But what I settled on was some simple yet insightful facts around working alone and staying safe in the visitor economy in the hope that it uh, makes you interested enough in the topic to really look into it more yourself and see how you can protect your staff more, or, or even you know just grab a coffee or wanna hop on a call with me and kind of continue that conversation. So that takes me through to the, the poll, the quiz. Uh, the link is in chat, uh, and if you can go onto slido.com and, and join here, and I can actually see how many people, oh, a lot of people, cool. 26 people, so I'll drop that link in there again, just, to, just so everyone's got it. Um, that's there if you wanna sign up. I'll have to fly through it, uh, given we've only got 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump forward. Uh, so yeah, this is an attempt to make safety a little bit more engaging. It's not always the, the most exciting topic to, to discuss, uh, but hopefully this will give you some kind of um, eye-opening insight into what just some of the, the scary and interesting facts around, around safety and loan working in the visitor economy. So to start, we've just got a test question just so you, you guys can all see what is, what is actually going on. You're gonna have 20 seconds to answer the question, um, multiple choice, so you don't have to be uh, super clued in. Uh, pick the answer you think is right. We've got, this is a test question, thanks, what, I understand, and I think I'm on the wrong call, which I hope that's not everyone here if they stay to this point. Cool, and then I can pop out see who's voted what and everyone pretty much the majority got the right answer which is good to see um, so if we jump onto the first actual question of this quiz how many loan workers are there in the uk this is just people working alone um, doing anything on their own really uh, and this is pre-covid19 because that is as you can imagine really changed the numbers um, so we've got 4 million 8 million 14 million or 23 million and this is people that any part of their day are, are working alone Let's see what we got. So we're looking at closely between 8 million and 14 million. Well, I can tell you the correct answer actually is 6 to 8 million. So most of you got, got the right answer there. Uh, and that's near now around 8 million loan workers currently in the UK. So you know, over 20% of the entire UK workforce are defined as by the you know, health and safety executive, all their guidelines are defined as loan workers. And when you think about loan working, it really does touch almost every industry. When it comes to the visitor economy, you, you can see it in property, uh, whether you're managing a hotel or an Airbnb, you've got all your late night staff, cleaning, hotel staff, any security. Um, and that's not even touching things like transportation when you're looking at you know, taxis, even to train drivers. Um, so loan working uh, and looking after your loan working stuff is a really, really big thing for the visitor economy. And we can't uh, also forget that a large portion of uh, the visitors are actually loan working business staff themselves. So popping on to the next question, how often do you think a violent incident occurred at work in 
Here we go. One violent incident every 10 seconds, one a minute, one an hour, or one a day. Let's see what we've got. So we've got most people, the majority of people seem to think a violent incident occurred at work once every hour. So I can tell you the correct answer is actually one violent incident a minute, pretty much 694,000 incidents of violence at work in 2017-18. It actually comes out to 1.3 violent incidents every minute for the year. Um, and here's some breakdown of kind of the, the sectors where it hit the most. Uh, on the left here, you can see anyone in protective service occupations, obviously like security and things like that, are at the highest risk, which is you know, what you would think. There was 83,000 incidents, uh, which is 12% of the figures. On the right, you can see health and social care workers weren't too far away from security, um, 35,000 incidents, which is 5% of the total figures. Uh, and in the middle there, it's just an average across all industries, and that's around 1.4%. And that's still 10,000 um, violent incidents uh, at work which is a significant number uh, and it's not just the so it's not just the accidents uh, we need to pay attention to in the workplace but it's also the people that we're working with um, you know even members of the public and this is again especially important for the visitor economy where individuals are very likely to be working with uh, members of the public that are you know far from home or with kind of anybody that's that's traveling and that kind of puts you at a bit more risk because you're more often than not um, more alone when you're traveling so moving on to the next question, which industry do you think the highest rate of workplace fatalities? Let's just turn that question on. Construction, manufacturing, agriculture, or transportation? All right, let's see what we got. So we've got agriculture at 40% and construction closely followed. Well, I can, I can tell you that's actually pretty spot on. Um, with the correct answer here, you see the correct answer is agriculture. Uh, and here's the graph for that for 2018-19. For agriculture was, uh, did have the highest rate of workplace fatalities at 32, very closely followed by, by construction, you can see here. So 2018-19 figures are in the dark green and then the annual average since 2014-15 uh, is in light green. So when you average it all out, all out construction has actually got the highest, uh, highest rate of fatalities, which you know, most people seem to, to get that agriculture and construction are pretty dangerous fields to be in. But it is worth noting that category containing uh, accommodation and food still had 18 fatalities. And this always shocks me as a really high number for an area that you kind of think is relatively safe. Um, and it's also really interesting to, to track these statistics over different periods of time. So we actually found a year where there were the same amount of fatalities in services industries as there were in construction, which was uh, 31 fatalities in one of the years, which is real eye opener to kind of let you know that, wow, this just because I'm doing a role that I don't necessarily think is particularly dangerous, you know, these accidents really can, can happen to anybody. Um, and moving on from, from these incidents, um, how many years of work were lost in the UK due to these work-related injuries within these incidents in, in 2016, 2017? Um, was it 150 years of work, 2,000 years of work, 6,500 years of work, or 15,000 years of work lost due to work-related uh, injuries? So between 6,500 or 2,000? Well, I can tell you that the correct answer is actually 15,000. So there were 15,000 um, years of work lost uh, in 2016-17. Uh, that's actually 5.5 million days of work, which for a fun fact is the same uh, amount of people that actually live in Finland. So it's the equivalent of every single person in Finland taking a day off. Uh, that's how many work-related injuries or how many years and days were lost due to work-related injuries, which is just absolutely massive. And, and as we can see from the results there, when you actually put it in figures, you're, you're, like, you're slightly mind blown. 
So moving on to the last question here, which age, age group do you think is most at risk to being involved in a workplace fatality? So I'm not gonna read all these categories out because there's, there's a whole bunch of them, but 16 all the way through to 65 plus, who is most at risk to having one of these workplace fatalities? So 16 to 19 or 20 to 24 got pretty much the majority of the vote there. So this is actually my favorite question uh, in, in any of these quizzes that I do, because the correct answer is actually, it doesn't even show on the screen down here because it's 65 plus and nobody, nobody even voted for it, which is, which is brilliant because, because there's an insight that definitely nobody knew. So if I go back to the presentation, here's the graph of, um, workplace fatalities by age. Uh, and this is the, the rate of fatal injuries um, per 100,000 workers by age. Uh, and as you can see, the most at-risk group are anyone over the age of 65. Um, they're actually four times more likely to be involved in a workplace fatality than the all uh, age average that you can see at the bottom. And there really is a clear trend of more workplace fatalities as employees get older, uh, you know, which often goes against what people think like I said, every time I give this presentation, the majority of people think younger categories are more likely to be involved in a fatal accident, whereas that's simply not the case. Uh, I haven't got the graph in the presentation now, but I can tell you when it comes to reported accidents, it's kind of a bit of a peak in the middle. So around 35 to 44 have the most reported accidents, but when it actually comes to um, these incidents and accidents becoming fatalities, it's the older categories that, that are way ahead of any of the younger categories. So that is the, the end of the quiz. We can actually, um, I think, have a look to see if we've got a, got a winner. Adrian Melrose, you won. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, but going back to the presentation. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've got, um, how did these fatalities occur? So I read through, you can read online, the Health and Safety Executive uh, publish a lot of these, these fatalities and some of them are really, really terrible stories to read. Uh, and I went through a whole bunch of them to kind of get the, the gist of how these, these incidents were happening. And I've, I've just got three here, just to give you an example. Um, first one was a worker was killed when he fell from a ladder. Uh, he was found on the ground with a ladder beside him. Uh, second one, worker crushed and killed by a tree branch who was found trapped beneath the tree branch. Uh, and the third one, an employee was working on a, a filtration unit uh, and it's thought that he fell into the water and he was found face down in the water. Now, one thing I found reading through a lot of these is there's something that the majority of them really do have in common. Uh, and that's the fact that they were all found. Uh, I did shorten the summaries of those incidents because they're, they're pretty uh, lengthy descriptions. But in most cases, it's quite clear that a lot of these fatalities are, for the most part, people that were working alone. You know, avoidable fatalities if you knew the incident had happened. Uh, now, normally here, I go on to discuss compliance and what businesses can do to protect their staff and all the regulations and things like that. But because this is quite a short presentation, I'm simply going to tell you how we use tech at SafePoint to fix that problem. And this is exactly the, the kind of problem we're working to solve. So we provide a safety system that provides automatic alarming, allowing you to meet all of your compliance requirements, but more importantly, instantly increase the safety of your staff. There's a really quick video clip here. But just to give you a gist of what we do, we have mobile apps uh, and hardware that mean if something goes wrong, uh, someone hasn't said, okay, I'm safe. You say you've got I don't know, a cleaner in a building late at night. They let you know when they've done that job and, and when, they're, when they're fine. And if they're not fine, an alarm's trigger, you know about it. That's really the, the very core of what we do at SafePoint. Um, I've summarized that in just six points, just to, just to close off the presentation with, but, these are the main benefits that we provide when it comes to safety. And that's the fact that you really don't have to think about deploying safety much. You shouldn't have to. You can you know, sign up and get going in minutes. And that's the big thing we've worked towards is making safety so, so simple. Uh, the fact that you can see the real time staff location uh, of everyone you, you work with out in the field. So, you know, if something goes wrong, you know exactly where they are. One huge one that people often overlook with safety tools is increased worker confidence. If you're um, working with the public or you know, you're, you're a security guard or like I said, the cleaner going into rooms, knowing that someone's there watching out for you if something do, does go wrong is a massive, massive confidence booster. 
the fact we have automated alarms and things like that removes all of that human error and allows you to respond immediately to incidents. And then, of course, you've got that full safety audit trail. So if you need to you know, do your RID or reports or send anything off to the health and safety executive or your management or whatever, all that information is there. Uh, but the huge core one for the business is, of course, instant compliance. So that is everything I've got for you today. Hopefully the quiz at the beginning was, was insightful and highlighted some of the things you didn't already know about safety and, and kind of give you, give you some, some thoughts on how you could potentially increase safety within your business. Uh, I hope that the very brief demo of SafePoint there has, has shown that there is tech out there that, that makes this easier. Uh, it makes it easier to give your staff that confidence boost, tick those regul regulatory boxes and you know just keep on top of any incidents that may happen. Um, in your business. My contact details are on screen. So if you want to chat further, feel free to drop me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce um, James Kindred, who is the uh, co-founder of Big Drop Brewing. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, how Big Drop as a business dealt with the, the COVID uh, situation. And before we get into that, just want to give you a bit of background about myself and talk about my experience in um, a few different industries that may be relevant to, to, the, to the things we've been talking about today and just give you a point of reference of where my experience comes from and, and how I've learned all these things over the years. So I was a graphic designer for 16 odd years. Um, I started when I was about 20 years old at um, a couple of agencies and then moved up to creative director and art director at a few different regional agencies. Um, and then in 2012, I met one of the uh, previous speakers this morning, Adrian, or around 2012, and we uh, we started InStyle, and uh, we worked on that, and Adrian talked about that earlier, and that's a fantastic system, a fantastic product. And then in 2016, I I had the opportunity um, of creating a, a beer company um, with a, a, an old, a very old friend of mine who I played in bands with for years. He actually conducted my wedding ceremony to my wife. Uh, way back many moons ago and he had the idea of creating a alcohol-free beer company completely dedicated to making nothing else but alcohol-free beer and this was around 2016 and, and no one else was doing it at the time you had a few different options out there you had Bex Blue you had Bitburger Drive you didn't have much else um, so we thought we'd start a company around making uh, dedicated to making just alcohol-free beer. So we now have four core styles, one of which you'll see on the screen here, which is our Citra IPA. And you'll also see, if you go to our website, there's lots of other seasonal styles and, and different opportunities available. And they all taste like the full strength version of the brew. So if you like a um, mango-y, uh, refreshing, um, fruity pale ale, then the Citra IPA is gonna be for you. If you like a really dark, uh, rich chocolatey coffee note stout, then the galactic stout is going to be for you as well. So lots of different options out there. And um, in the last four years or so, we've won multiple beer awards all, all over the world. We've won against full strength competitors. So um, we, we enter into category. Originally, there didn't used to be a alcohol free category. There used to be a, um, a uh, kind of a novelty beer category and there used to be the standard categories. And we'd enter into those. And we beat beers in full strength categories. So our Galactic Stout won against a 6.4 chocolate porter because they are tasting it based on balance and flavor and they don't know what the ABB is. So we're currently in the process of launching in the USA and Australia, um, which has its own challenges at the moment. Um, and we're, we're actually filling into can this week in Australia. Um, I also run a uh, design and ideas consultancy. So from all my years of technology and building technology solutions, and also from a graphic design point of view, I help businesses work out how to bring technology into their business in the best way, in the simplest way, because you want to be able to, if you want to enhance how you use business, or how you use technology in your business, and you don't have technical understanding, then I'll try and help you find the best way to, to make sure that technology works. Um, what I'm here to talk about today, so I don't really wanna talk about technology on the whole, I wanna talk about how technology can help you, um, but I wanna talk about being reactive and agile and, and what that means and how it could possibly help your business and also talk about how it helped my business as well. So one of the principles of design or digital marketing or technology or building new technology as a whole is you, you create something, you, you release it, 
you measure how that thing does and then you improve that thing over time. So in an ideal world, if you're building something, you have a long period of time to be able to work out if something's working and you can work out if that is doing well or if you need to improve it. Um, in, in critical situations like we've got at the moment, um, you need to adapt or pivot quickly. You need to come up with an idea, you need to measure it, you need to change, you need to keep moving quite quickly. Um, part of that is getting rid of the things that don't work. So you dump the elements that don't work, you focus on the success and you increase the resource that are dedicated to that thing over time. So perhaps you take that idea yourself, you work out if it works and if it starts working, you can grow it and you bring other people in. So that could be third parties or that could be other people in your business. Um, part of the important uh, process of taking something on and, and working with it quickly is you start with a small team or work as an individual and then bring other people in over time. So you, again, you could outsource it. Um, obviously the larger the business, the harder it is to change course. But always the good analogy of that is if you're a big uh, corporate business or, or a large structured company, you're, you're more like a, a, a tanker, a fuel ta a oil tanker ship, very long time to kind of change course. Whereas if you're a smaller business, you can tack, you're in a smaller yacht, you can move around a lot quicker. But there shouldn't be an excuse within small businesses that you have a team that can, that can work quickly and, and um, do that sort of thinking within your team. So what I'm talking about today is what we did at Big Drop and how COVID affected us and what we did to change things. So as I said before, critical, critical moments in business demand quick reactions. You need to, you need to think, how can I, how can I maneuver around this situation? Um, the impending lockdown in March brought that very much into the fore for Big Drop. Obviously we sell um, into pubs and bars. We're in a, a lot of pubs and bars all over the UK. And that was our big sales strategy for this year. Um, that stopped almost overnight. We could see it coming in March um, and we were trying to work out how to, how to go about it. So the, the pubs we were in at that time, we were in all bar one, Barworks pubs, brew house and kitchen, Miller and Carter, Pig Hotels, Hoxton Hotels, Young's, Fuller's, Patty and Bun, and many more independents just closed their doors overnight. That meant we really had nowhere to sell a lot of our beer. Um, so we had to change things fast. We had to work out what we could do to shift our beer and, and, and find ways to get it into, into people's hands and into people's glasses. So we're not a tech first business. I'm from a tech background, but we, we very much rely on traditional brewing processes, traditional sales strategies. We have sales team, a sales team who are on foot, on the ground, going and seeing people doing things the traditional kind of beer sales way. But technology can help. There's always, there's always a way, I, I feel that there's always a way that technology can help you do certain things and make things easier. So the challenge we had with Big Drop was we had to reach an audience who was stuck at home. No one was going out. No one was going into pubs and bars and, and drinking. And no one was going to restaurants and, and drinking our beer with their meals. So uh, along with that, we had to create and maintain engagement. So we had to make sure that we could reach people, but we could also reach people and get them to come back or, or that we could create a relationship with those people. And we had to find a way to get customers, uh, get beer to, to customers at a time when none of our retail distributors were running, running at full tilt. They were on skeleton staff, so distribution and sales and uh, delivery times were slow and unreliable. And the off-trade availability was limited because the independent retailers were closing. So the big supermarkets were open. We're in Wait Waitrose, we're in Morrison's, we're in um, Ocado, um, we're in Sainsbury's from this week, um, but the smaller independents were on a forced lockdown, so we couldn't sell beer through them. So the plan we came up with, um, the first one was a point of sale approach, how we could sell our beer. So we wanted to do direct sales and we'd never done it before. We'd always done it through distribution partners and we'd always, any new inquiries, we just went to a distribution partner and said, speak to them about getting set up. So Ebria, Matthew Clark, people like that, people would have to set an account up. We want to change that and do a direct customer approach. So we set up a Shopify store. Shopify is a very simple e-commerce platform. Um, and we built it in two days and launched it and got it out there and just did, just did something to, to, measure, to get something out and, and start measuring things. So if you go to shop.bigdropbrew.com, you'll be able to see the, the store as it is now. Um, and then 
we took some of our on-trade sales staff and moved them into a pick and pack operation. So they could they could be on hand to pack orders, any orders that came in. And obviously we didn't know at this point how many people were gonna come and order from us because we'd never done it before. And then the other thing we did was retrieve stock from wholesalers who were shut down. So a lot of wholesalers weren't just on a, on a, on a skeleton staff that actually completely shut up shop because they were purely distributing to on trade pubs and bars and that sort of thing. And, and, and distribution stopped overnight. So we retrieved a lot of our stock from them. And the other thing we did was um, boost our stock and presence through, through the Amazon vendor platform. So we didn't, we had, we were selling some things on Amazon, but it wasn't a core strategy. Um, but what we want to do is, is bring Amazon into um, the, the front and start having a presence on Amazon. So we had another way to fulfill sending product to customers. Um, and then we had to create visibility. So having all of that there and not having a way to direct customers or drive awareness of the brand to new customers. Um, if you don't have this bit, then it, it's, it, it's not really worth doing the other bit. So we came up with an idea of having a living room pub quiz. Um, and running it on YouTube and just seeing if people would join it. Again, it's about putting something out there, launching it quickly, measuring it, and then seeing if you can improve on it. So our YouTube channel had no subscribers and uh, the, the team amongst us had zero live broadcasting experience. We'd done Zoom calls, we'd done Skype, we'd done um, FaceTime meetings and that sort of thing, but nothing out to YouTube or any live broadcast. Um, I had a little bit of an idea of how to do it, um, but not a great deal. Uh, it was a very new new area for me. But my webcam was was quite good, and uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll step up and, and have a go at doing it and see how it goes. So week one, absolute disaster. Um, the software that I'd bought in to try and help me run the quiz fell over about five seconds before going live. Uh, the encryption key that I had for broadcasting my video onto YouTube expired and I had to quickly rush around and work out how to um, revive what we were doing. So there's a shot of me on week one in the cabin, you can see it here behind me, uh, and my daughter in fits of hysterics while I'm trying to pull cables out of things and get things working. Um, but people joined in and people played and people sort of enjoyed it and it was it's a little bit disorganized and a bit chaotic, but we learned a lot from it. And it generated traffic to our store, um, whether that was uh, pity traffic of people feeling sorry for me because of how bad it had gone, or whether it was people who were genuinely interested in buying our product, it was probably 50-50, I don't know. But we learned a lot from it. So by week three, I'd learned a lot more about what I needed to do. I'd measured what worked and got the software working. So we could have a proper branded uh, setup. I could have questions on screen. I could have people chatting to me, similar to how you're chatting is in today. And I could also um, make sure that people could play at any time. So they could either play live or they could come back later and play the, the, the recorded version. So there was a lot I learned and we measured and we iterated really quickly. So part of the measuring and the, the iteration and the changing things is that we knew that it was generating an audience by about week three, we were getting about 10,000 people a week, uh, either taking part live or viewing after the, after the um, live stream had gone out. It was getting strong media attention. We managed to get into timeout and we were in GQ. I was uh, in the top 10 um, or cool things to do during lockdown. And that was between David Attenborough and Gary Barlow, I think, which is a, a weird position to be, let alone being in a list in GQ. And then we started thinking about what else would work. So this was working and, and we could improve on that. But what were the other things that we could perhaps try and experiment with outside of what the pub quizzes were doing? So the first thing we did was living room pub gigs. So we reached out to uh, recording artists and performers to, who also were suffering during lockdown and gave them a platform through our YouTube channel to do live shows. So they set up their uh, um, account. We used a piece of software called StreamYard and they could broadcast directly onto our YouTube channel without any, any of them needing too much know-how. And we also did lockdown cook-alongs, which, uh, which we had food, uh, beer and food writer Melissa Cole helping out with. So from her home, every week she would do a YouTube premiere where she'd do a cook-along and she'd use one of our beers as part of the recipe. So again, that's just giving people 
more content to be able to absorb and using our product front and center throughout it. Um, the, the thing we learned really quickly from both of those is that the pub quiz has really worked because people prefer to participate than have passive content that they're just kind of absorbing. People can get that sort of content from anywhere. So they can sit and watch Amazon Prime, they can watch Netflix, they can watch Disney Plus, they can view uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of, of video on YouTube and just absorb it. And that doesn't give people any engagement. If you give them a way to engage, similarly to how Callum did in the last presentation, they're gonna be more inclined to feel like they're taking part and give them a reason to come back another time. So we, we dropped the idea with the pub gigs and the, and the cook-alongs because they were kind of quite time intensive and they also weren't generating the audience that we were getting from the pub quiz. So we focused on that and then we started to improve the format and focus on social interaction. So we brought social rounds in. So if you go back and look at our videos that are on YouTube every week, we do a social round and we'd ask people to use the hashtag living room pub quiz on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and get them to take part in some way. So the first quiz was the first week, or the first or second week, we asked them to draw a picture of a can of Big Drop the set, and post it on social media. The second week, we asked them to put as many jumpers on as they could, um, and then take a photograph and put it on social media. And that was another way that we could generate uh, awareness for the brand and generate awareness for what we were doing with the pub quizzes. And we'd also give a discount code away every week. So if people were coming back week to week, we'd give a discount code away and they could get a discount from our store. So we'd try and engage and convert people from playing the pub quiz. And then we started to ask people how they'd like us to do the quiz. So we said, what rounds would you like us to do? Go and vote on our Facebook page, go and vote on our Instagram stories. And again, it's giving people a reason to take part. And it's also drawing a larger audience in from their friends and their connections on the social networks. And the other thing we wanted to make sure that we were doing was creating content that had a lasting value. So creating topical content is great, but also try and create something that people can come back and, and, and make, get use from again. So we still get um, a thousand odd views a week across, our, um, across the series of pub uh, quizzes we did, because you can play them at any time. You can play along and you can have 10 people in 10 different houses playing uh, the pub quiz on a Zoom call or on a uh, FaceTime or on a WhatsApp chat. They can press play at 10, in 10 different locations and, and still play along. So it's a great way of making sure that there's some longevity to the content. Um, and the other important bit as well was making sure that we can increase store traffic as well. So doing the pub quiz is great, but generating revenue is the, is the, is the goal here. So one of the things we want to make sure that we do is you know, thank the frontline staff and the NHS to, for what an incredible job they, they were doing and they are doing throughout the crisis. Uh, so we gave a discount Onto the, onto the store for them, which generated more traffic and more interest, but obviously there's a, there's a feel good factor uh, to that as well. And then we started to incentivize return customers with discount code. So if people um, had bought from us once and they bought, they spent more than 30 pounds, we'd send them a 10% discount code to incentivize them to come back. And that's all around creating habits and creating return custom and making people feel that it's easy to buy from us. Same with the booking process. As Adrian was talking about earlier, it's got to be a seamless process and there's got to be really uh, engaging points where they can, they can come back and buy again. Um, we gave discount codes to the new subscribers to our mailing list. So if you go to bigdropbrew.com, uh, you'll be asked if you wanna sign up to our mailing list. If you do that, um, sometime later, we'll send you a little thank you and you'll get a 10% discount code. Um, so it's, it's another great way to, to start engaging new customers through, through email marketing and different, different channels. Um, and the other th important thing about the, the online presence is reviews. Um, there's the, 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 the dreaded uh, TripAdvisor, which we, in our business, we don't have to worry about too much. Um, but Google reviews, Amazon reviews is a really important thing for our business. And for an accommodation business, Google reviews is still very relevant as well. So if you've got an accommodation business or a tourism destination, focus on getting the Google reviews up as well, because that's going to help your search results. So we incentivized customers to go and give us a review and gave them a discount code as soon as they could prove they'd left the review for us. And then we were doing things which kind of covers some of the things that Nathan was talking about earlier through um, paid search strategy with um, Google Shopping. So we were paying to be placed in Google Shopping and making sure that people could see our product. It looked really nice. The right messaging was there as well. Okay, so the results, uh, which is probably the, the important thing, uh, it was the important thing for us. Um, it went quite well. 
So the Living Room Pub Quiz, um, over the 10 weeks, we had 107,000 views. Um, it's probably gone a lot up a little more since then. Um, but the total number of views, we had 107,000 people taking part in some way, which resulted in about 950 days of total view time, um, which if you're a massive YouTube channel is quite small, but from a standing start for, for our very small channel is, is great. Um, and we've got 2,200 subscribers and that's gone up again, I think in, in the last week or so. But that means we've got an audience that we can re-engage with at some time if we, if we want to. Um, obviously, YouTube channels can kind of go uh, or drop down in the rankings if you're not constantly engaging. But having that 2,200 subscriber uh, starting point is great for us for any new product launches, that sort of thing we want to do. And then the big drop shop, which, which is the, 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 the means to the ends, really. Um, so the conversion rate on the big drop shop was uh, around 9.5%. So anyone that came to the shop uh, around, well, almost if 100 people came to the shop, almost 10 people would, would buy something, which is fantastic. That's a really good conversion rate. Um, I, I think um, my standard kind of bar for conversion rates is about 3% for e-commerce uh, if, if you're doing well. So 9.5% is fantastic. Um, and customers would come back. So about 30% of the customers that bought from us once would buy from us a second time or a third time or a fourth time. And it's maintaining that relationship. And, and finding ways to re-engage with those people every time. Um, and in May, our revenue was, uh, we did just over 40,000 pounds in sales revenue um, through the Big Drop Shop, which is a fantastic way to, to bring where the revenue we're making from the pubs and bars and the restaurants uh, and find a different way of making that revenue. So that's fantastic when you're gonna carry on doing that. And then the Amazon Weekly uh, stock order, they, they're placing orders for about eight to 10,000 pounds worth of stock a week as well, which is fantastic, that's grown. A considerable amount. So what do we do next? What's the next thing that we want to do to make sure that we, we keep this momentum going? Um, we'll continue with the online strategy. It works really well. We know it's we know we can keep growing it. So we're going to start recruiting a e-commerce manager. Um, we're going to adapt the store to support wholesale rates. We launched that uh, earlier this week. So wholesale customers can go in and order direct from us based on a minimum order quantity. And uh, we can um, start to support that and grow that as the off-trade and the on-trade sector opens back up. Continue down traditional routes. Uh, so we, we won't just rely on a digital strategy. It's all about blending it. Um, and we're now available in Waitrose, Sainsbury's, and we're also available in Nando's in the UK as well. So around 200 odd Nando's restaurants will stock Big Drop. So if you're doing a drive-by uh, collection or you've got a Deliveroo, you'll be able to order a Big Drop Pale Ale as part of your order. Um, and then we want to extend our reliance on uh, SaaS, which is software as a service and custom digital tools. And as we go into new markets, that's really going to help us keep in touch with customers and segment customers as well. So we're launching in Australia in the next few weeks um, and we're launching in the USA at the end of this year as well. We want to make sure that we use digital to, to leverage our relationships all over the, all over the world. And then we want to make sure that we're supporting our uh, existing markets as well. So we're available in Scandinavia, the Netherlands, Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, and we want to create direct sales channels for them as well. So we can reach the consumer direct uh, through those different channels. So that's the story. That's where we're up to. And if you'd like to try the beer and you've not tried the beer before, or if you have and you'd like to treat yourself, um, now's your chance. So if you go to shop.bigdropbrew.com, there's a 20% off discount for anyone that's watching with a tourism and tech code. Uh, if you use that, you'll get 20% off your first order and uh, order whatever you like. I recommend the poolside, uh, which is amazing special edition beer we've bought out. Um, and the Citra IPA is my favorite. If you like the darker beers, try the stout. Absolutely. Terms of supply, uh, one, per, one use per customer expires at the end of this month. Uh, and that's it from me. Thank you very much. If I could now hand over to uh, Jason Middleton, who's program manager at programs manager at New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership. Jason, over to you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about grants. I'm going to talk to you about our growth hub uh, and the sorts of businesses support that you can access um, through our growth hub. So, um, just to start with a bit of a, um, a bit of a statistic. Um, it's estimated that four, there are about 4,000 business support schemes around at any one time. And that is a best guess. Uh, the reality is no one actually knows how many there are. I've seen estimations that it could be up to 10,000. This is a major challenge because if you're a business out there looking for support, 
how on earth can you find what you're looking for and what you need? It's very, very difficult. So if you're a and b owner, for example, in Chroma, where do you go to find this information? Well, you can go online. Um, online is very good, very helpful, very, very important. As we know, tech's great. Um, and it's really good for some things, um, finding insurance and things like that. Tech is great, it's fantastic. But actually, we don't do things by tech. We keep things real. And please, I don't want any comparisons between the, uh, the animal that was on the previous screen with lots of hair and Richard, uh, who is our growth hub manager. Richard is very real. Uh, he does a fantastic job uh, looking after our growth hub and providing a wide range of um, business support. And his team are essentially there to help you as business owners. Uh, the growth hub operates from nine to five, Monday to Friday. At any time you can give the growth hub uh, a ring or you can email them. Uh, or you can uh, you can hashtag them, <coughs> go onto their website, excuse me, and there's a huge range of support um, that is available. So what do they actually do? Well, our growth hub covers Norfolk and Suffolk, so it covers the New Anglia LEP area, and it's essentially been set up to be a single point of contact for a really wide range of business help and support. It's completely free. They are completely impartial. They're not paid bonuses for um, targets etc and it's completely confidential so anything you discuss with that business advisor stays with that business advisor we don't share the confidential conversations that you will be having with other partners the team are very experienced most of them in fact all of them have run their own business at some stage and they're peripatetic and until the lockdown they came to you they came to your business premises to talk to you about your business we don't expect people to travel to get business support they will undertake a review of your business. They will talk to you. And then they have a huge range of access of local and national support that they can talk to you about and they can tap into. And they can also help you access a wide range of grants and other financial support, which in the current climate is particularly important. It's the Growth Hub's job to go and find things. So here are some examples of the thoughts of things they will they will go and help you with. So you may be looking for finance. They will help you identify financial providers. They talk to all the major high street banks and lenders. They will help you identify grants. You may talk to them and identify that you would like some mentoring. You want someone to come in and actually help you and your business to grow more quickly or in the current situation to survive. They can arrange that. They can also look at specialist business support and we've got a team of two specialist skills advisors who can talk to you just about skills in your workforce and help you and your teams go out and identify the training and support that you need. They can provide you advice and guidance on premises and accommodation and they can also give you uh, advice and access to uh, a various number of our schemes like our scale up uh, program which is designed to help businesses with um, high growth potential. The other thing the Growth Hub can say is no, and this is really important. If you're thinking about doing something, investing in your business, they can help you identify what to do, but they can also help you identify what not to do so you don't fall through the pitfalls. And they can also go away and talk to funders if you're looking for funding and get an answer really quickly as to the likelihood of you being successful to try and save you and your business time. So the Growth Hub is there um, to go and look for support. So here are some examples of the support. Now, the one that I always say to, um, to, to, to businesses is there's someone to talk to. They're a real person who you can sit down or do a video call or a telephone call and talk to face to face. That's really important. They'll help you to identify your business priorities. They will also talk you and guide you through the existing COVID-19 support and advice. And the way we do this is every day we provide the Growth Hub with a script. This script um, is full of all the local and national business support information. It's about 170 pages. Uh, we started this at the beginning of the lockdown. I think as, as of last night, we're on version 52 and it is updated every evening. So when you see the government ministers making a statement, announcing a new scheme at sort of five o'clock in the evening or on the evening news, We've got a team within our communications team within the LEP who will actually update 
that script. So at nine o'clock the next day, it's absolutely bang up to date. They can assist you to diversify your business. They can look at, at working ways to cut your cost or save time, and they can help you apply for grants and funding. I'm now just going to give you some examples of some of the LEP schemes that we have available, and then I'm just going to talk to you about um, the local authority discretionary grant scheme. So the first scheme is our small grant scheme. This is a very, very simple grant scheme. It's very, very easy to apply for. Provides grant between a thousand and twenty-five thousand pounds, up to twenty percent of your project costs, and those costs can be capital or revenue activities. The scheme was designed to support business growth. However, obviously, in the current circumstances, we are looking at flexing the rules of the schemes as much as possible. It is a very simple application process. The Growth Hub advisor will talk you through that process and help you fill the form in, and it's a four page form. We're not talking of reams and reams of paperwork here that you have to complete. It can be done, it's a Word document, it's very, very simple. And the approval is in days, and I mean days. We've had examples of an application being submitted on a Monday, and by Friday, the business has had the offer letter. We know time is of the essence. So for example, you um, you might be a, a um, tourism attraction. You want to introduce um, a new facility. The small grant scheme could give you some funding and some support towards that particular project. The second one is our growing business fund. Growing business fund very similar to the small grant scheme. It's the sort of the bigger brother or sister, twenty five to five hundred thousand, up to twenty five percent intervention rate. This is a capital grant scheme. So not, no revenue activity, so it won't fund things like um, marketing, etc. but it'll buy things. Again, designed around business growth, but we're showing flexibility. Because of the size of the grants, it's a slightly longer application process. It's two stage. You fill an expression of interest form in first to find out whether you're eligible. And when we say whether you're eligible, we'll be 90% certain at this stage. It then goes through a due diligence and a, a more enhanced application process. And we are talking weeks rather than uh, months. This is not like some of the, the big lottery and some of the big schemes where you've got to wait six, six months for a decision. We are talking weeks here. Um, so for example, this scheme is aimed at maybe larger um, visitor attractions. Uh, again, if they want to introduce new things, there's a grant that they can potentially tap into. Now, there's two new schemes that we've recently launched. Um, GTI, Growth for Innovation, is one of those. This scheme was launched at the beginning of April. It's almost exactly the same as the small grant scheme. In fact, it's the same application form. We like to keep things simple for everybody. Again, grants between 1,000 and 25,000. This time up to 50%. Capital and revenue, as the small grant scheme is. This scheme is there to support innovation, research and development around businesses. So this wouldn't necessarily be there to support a B&B &B or an accommodation provider. However, it may support some of the businesses um, that are service sector to, to, to those businesses. So we've, we've seen earlier quite a lot of tech businesses talking about introducing their new products that this will benefit the sector. This scheme is largely aimed at them. Again, same application form, a small grant scheme, very simple. And again, the application uh, approval process is in a matter of days, not weeks. Uh, and then the final scheme that I'm going to talk about, which is a LEP scheme, is our business resilience and recovery scheme. This is a brand new scheme and we've introduced this uh, because of the impact of COVID-19. This provides grants between 25 and 50,000 pounds, up to 50% of your project costs. It will fund capital items. However, alongside the scheme, we are also offering support around consultancy. So if you, um, if you talk to the Growth Hub and the Growth Advisor thinks actually you would benefit from some consultancy, someone helping you in your business to identify what the best way forward is, through this program, we can provide that consultancy, consultancy, consultancy for you completely free of charge. It's there to support uh, resilience and recovery. Again, same application forms as GTI and small grant scheme, decision in a matter of days. With this scheme, it's really about a sort of change in the business practice. So for example, if you're uh, a B&B, 
uh, it would support significant improval, Im improvements. So if you did things to improve your rating, it would be potentially eligible. What we wouldn't fund though is if you decided to go to B&Q and buy some paint and just re redecorate the room. So you need to talk to the growth of advisor just to, 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 to work out exactly what your project entails. And the way that we do that is we want you to talk about everything we think you're investing in because we want to put as much as we can into these projects because the bigger the projects, the more money we can give you. I also very briefly want to talk to you about the local authority discretionary um, grant schemes. I know Graham mentioned these um, earlier. Uh, they're up to £25,000 if you occupy a property. Uh, and you're eligible if your mortgage and rent costs are below £51,000 per annum. Um, the scheme was fairly rigid when it was originally launched. Um, the, the original funding for local authorities, however, however, government have relaxed them in, in terms of discretionary scheme. So it's aimed at small businesses in shared offices, flexible workspace, market traders, B&Bs that are paying council tax. Now, I've called it discretionary grant schemes as plural because every local authority is slightly different. You can go directly to talk to your local authority. However, I really recommend that you go and talk to the Growth Hub first. You give them a call. You clearly identify which local authority area you're in. Using that script that I spoke about earlier, they will then work with you to try and identify whether you are potentially eligible. And the word is potentially. It's not a guarantee. They can then put you in contact with the local authority. Uh, and you can go through that application process. And if you're finding it difficult, you can always go back to the Growth Hub um, for, some, um, so for some more advice and guidance. So they're the things that are currently in place. What about things that are gonna happen in the future? Now, um, earlier on, um, Pete spoke about the Visitor Economy Recovery Plan, uh, which we're working with him and his team and other partners uh, as a LEP to put in place to clearly identify what the needs of, of the sector are and around that develop new support and new um, schemes for the sector. So, um, you know, how can we target businesses to provide them with support? There'll be local campaigns and national campaigns to support tourism. Um, we will help and work with businesses to restore both businesses and, and consumer confidence. And also one of the things that we are in the early stages of is looking at potentially a tourism small grant scheme. We're talking to government departments to try and get some money specifically for the tourism sector through that small grant scheme to support the businesses that we've not necessarily traditionally been able to, um, to do. So lots of support out there. How do you access it? This is the one takeout I want you to remember from today. This telephone number is absolutely crucial. And I want you to all write this down. 0300 333 6536. It's a free phone number. It won't cost you a penny. Nine o'clock till five o'clock, Monday to Friday, there will be a growth advisor available. 0300 333 6536. I'm not going to say it again, so don't worry. You won't talk to someone who's a call handler you will talk to a qualified business advisor who absolutely knows what they're talking about and will be able to help you straight away. They've also got the facility to use Zoom or Teams and other bits of software. So you can have a video call with them. They will call you back or you can call them. Uh, and if you start to talk to someone and you realize it's specialist, so for example, you want to talk to one of the skills advisors, they can quickly transfer you to one of those skills advisors as part of that call if they're free. So you don't have to, re uh, you don't have to call back. So please, please um, take this number down. Their job is to help you and help your business. I'm going to end here. Thank you for your time. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of kick this off um, with, I think, a really, a really, really great question uh, that we've had um, come in uh, around sort of uh, extending the season, if you like, and what role technology can play in doing that. And this is a question from Rebecca. So what do members of the panel think would help extend our business economy season and help make up for all that lost revenue that businesses have been experiences and i might i might ask actually adrian to, to start this first because i mean um it stateless must have some pretty good data um and instar must have some pretty good data on the kind of when bit and how that looks in the east of england Absolutely. I mean, today was the first day on the data graph that our, our bookings start, started looking 
like this time last year. So it's been dead for two, well, two months. Um, but um, we do have a lot of data, but, but, but I mean, it's all about audience. Every single booking um, is about, you know, is about audience. Uh, every single business and its value is about audience. So what I'd like to say is, you know, in, encourage people to say, well, who are our audiences? How can we reach them? James gave a, um, a, a very um, good, I, gave us a good impression on, on how to tap audiences, to find audiences. Um, I think there was a question earlier about hashtags and go in and have a look at where people are hanging around on hashtags and start hashtagging those hashtags and, um, and, and start, you know, start getting your content out to those audiences. So, I mean, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but the way you attract people and is by by talking to them and 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 reaching them. And so, just do an exercise about saying, "Well, what are my assets here? My assets are the people who've stayed with me before, my Instagram followers, my whatever they are. Um, that's your audience. How do I grow my audience? How can I tap into other people's audiences? How can I get involved in conversations? And how can I come come up with a with a proposition that will entice people, um, you know, maybe it is, maybe it is discounting. Um, you know, it's, um, it, people are, are, are gagging for a holiday and not many people can, um, um, can take one in the next month, I think. Um, but, but so it will filter uh, uh, into, the, into the new season, but it's about talking to and addressing your, your current audiences. I think I've just, um raise one of the things that, that the interesting things that Pete said is that that kind of to to escape seasonality as well and is to you know if you've got an audience who are coming and, and basing their stays on a on a certain period of time is try and engage that audience outside of their regular stay and give them something to come and stay for perhaps out of their what they believe their regular seasonality to be and try and engage a new audience or an existing audience to come and stay or, or engage with your tourism attraction or, or accommodation at a different time of the year. I think James summed that up perfectly. If you think about somewhere like Sheringham and the work they've done with their um, 1940s weekend, and you think actually it's about thinking outside the box, come together, create collectives, give people a reason to come. The only reason people don't come out of season is because there's not a compelling enough reason to go out of their way to come. Yes, the weather may play a part, but we can't affect the weather. We never will be able to. So do what you can do to give people a compelling enough reason to get off their backside and come and book and visit Norfolk. One of, one of the, um, the, the reasons um, that Norfolk does do so well is because we do have the potential of a year-round visitor economy already. Uh, Cornwall suffers because, as, as, as you just said, uh, Nathan, they don't have great weather. They do have a 12-week season. It's, it's how we can capitalise on that. You know, the best time to come here for things like walking, cycling, bird life, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those things happen, can happen in the, in the, in the winter. The bird life's the best for the largest seal colony in the country in the winter. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is going to be a, uh, a post-lockdown mass uh, breakout from cities and towns. Uh, it's not going to happen because furloughed workers are going to have to get back to, to kickstart the economy. Visit Britain's uh, consumer confidence monitor suggests that uh, very little traffic, uh, very little uh, visiting, traveling through the summer, but from October, 57% of people are thinking of taking a break. And I think that's, that's the real opportunity for us in this. Graham said it really well, you know, right at the moment, it, it's, we don't know how, how safe it is. We've got to make sure that, um, that we have robust um, got, uh, things put in place to ensure safety for, for, for visitors and residents alike. That's the reassurance campaign that we need to work on now. And then we not need to start thinking about the, the autumn and onwards. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so I think kind of slightly, slightly different question, not so much about, um, you know, how we drive the right kind of customer behaviors, but more about how we how we support um, businesses in the visitor economy increase their level of digital skills. So we, um, we put out a poll earlier about, you know, kind of what are essentially, what are your barriers to adopting tech? And what do you need? And the, um, the top the, 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 the top rank, ranked answer by some um, some margin was um, access to sort of digital skills and having them the, the right ones in your team. 
So we've got a really good question from Julie, um, Julie Schofield, which is, how can we work together to offer opportunities for our digitally savvy, savvy young people? Um, and, you know, I'm sure lots of us have got kids or, um, or, or, or family members, whatever, who are absolutely uh, digital natives and really confident with some of this technology in a way that their parents and grandparents are not. Um, I mean, those kids are going to be affected potentially, especially to, if they're towards the end of their schooling or uh, it, it, uh, studying at college or university at some real short, uh, op, uh, lack of opportunity in the labor market. You know, can we get um, our, our businesses uh, to be supported by some of these young people or more broadly, you know, if, you, if you're a tourism business and you don't have the digital skills today, where would you recommend that they should be to start? Perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask kind of I'm going to ask Callum to come in on this because I think Callum, you know, you've been building a you've been building a team. You've been very closely associated with UEA, um, and you uh, are, are providing these kind of opportunities. But what would you do if you weren't so technologically savvy as yourself? I think a, I think a big one with with anything like this, where uh, it's maybe you know a, a hotel business that isn't particularly tech savvy and wants to get these people in, is is, is trust. Uh, we've been lucky enough to be, work with UEA with interns uh, and we get a lot of offers for like work experience and uh, apprenticeships and things like that. Um, I think the big one is just to, it, it doesn't cost the earth and to get someone in for, we had an intern in for three months in the summer last year uh, and we just put them on our marketing. We had that, had a marketing plan, but we just you know trusted them to, they know their way around social media well, more than, more than most um, much more than me so to to put them kind of in their environment and trust them to go off and say all right we, we want to build this certain presence and it kind of goes back to what you said before when you want to engage with people in different areas and things like that so one of the things that this intern did was they went went on Facebook and found all these different groups were, that are particularly related to safety and tech and things like that and started really engaging with them and starting that conversation and that brought us in to different conversations in those groups and with these people that we wouldn't have had before so I think a big one is is to get these get these people and get this these younger generation that know their way around tech and trust them on a project and you know it's, I think that that's brilliant because there's there's so many interns especially at UEA which are so easy to get hold of uh, and they're just they're raring to go on a project they're, they'd love for you to give them a project brief and just say right go do that and for example the, the intern we have we barely had to manage them they just they, they went off and did everything absolutely perfectly um, so I think that's a great one there's so many opportunities like I said um, to, to get this younger generation in that know exactly what's going on with tech and if you want someone to do your, your hashtags like the question before I mean they they know everything that, that there is to know about it so a big one is just get them in and, and trust them to do it I think. If I could just add something Tim um, to, to what Callum said is is trust really important and you should let these people um, do what they they understand perhaps better than some of us middle-aged people um, but, uh, but I do think it's important um, that you go as a business to a digital agency like Nathan's or, 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 or the like to, to try and make sure that when you're spending time on, and I, I mentioned this in my presentation earlier, when you're spending time on driving audience and, and growing audience on, on social media and so on, that there is a clear uh, call to action. The call to action is, well, I'm going to, I'm going to click this link and book. And, and the thing is you can, you can find all sorts of really good Instagrammers out there, but if they are just building an audience and, and, and you're just inspiring somebody to go to another property or inspiring somebody to do something other than derive value for you, you're doing business development for somebody else. And so therefore you, you really need to make sure you've got the website and the journey and the booking engine so that you can convert all of that activity. I get I'm so frustrated by so many wonderful accommodation owners who's putting all this effort into it, but actually it never converts into money. It never converts into money. And that's the tragedy. So, so just invest a little bit with a good agency who can say, well, we've, we've got all of that so that when you do put that effort in, it converts. Tim, just very quickly, I just add that this kind of project relies on two things. One is time and the other is passion. So surrounding yourselves with other people that are interesting in, in this cause and how we can support it is really important. So it might be a task force that we set up or something like that. A lot of people talk the talk, 
but there's a great opportunity for some to now walk the walk. So how can we five, 10, 15 people come together to actually get a pilot group and to make it happen? So perhaps we can team up with the UEA, the colleges, the schools, that kind of thing. And people with that enthusiasm and drive can really push it through. But it obviously relies on time. And right now, a lot of us are time poor. Can I also add, Tim, and one of the experiences yeah. that I've had is the trust uh, as Callum and Adrian have said, it's really, really important. It's also really easy if, if you're not thinking through, particularly with the current pressures, to pick the wrong organisation to do the work for you. You know, so you're spending money and you get nothing. You're better off not spending the money. And I'm not saying don't don't spend the money. Um, so my advice would always be to any business is to start with the growth hub to give them a call because they can help the business go through the process of how do they identify the best people to help them. They won't say you need to choose business X, Y and Z, but they can say, look, you need to talk to at least three different organisations. This is how you do it. And actually, one of the things I'm going to offer now, and it's really simple, we do webinars on a whole range of things. Um, if several of you get together and say, actually, can we do a webinar on how you choose the right agency for this? I can talk to the growth hub and we can get that put on in a matter of weeks. No problem at all. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, really good. Um, and I'll just say we've got quite a few questions coming in on Q&A. There's still um, loads of stuff going on in the chat. If we're not able to answer every single question, and some of them I think are quite specific and maybe are things that need a kind of almost a technical response from uh, a growth hub advisor or perhaps um, our more general questions to do with you know as we move out of lockdown what the government timetable for guidance is I mean Pete's uh, Pete and his team have got great resources of knowledge around that obviously they're very very close to it um, but we'll try and answer some of these questions um, there's a really really I think important interesting question thinking about a kind of having an, an, a really inclusive um, area for visitors uh, in terms of people visiting, um, being able to find the right accommodation if they have particular needs. This was actually from David. Um, you know, how do we assure, ensure that disabled visitors can find the right information online about accommodation? Are we including information about access, showers, steps, and so on? It's an often an overlooked area. Um, I mean, I guess, Pete, do you want to kind of come in on this in terms of sort of visit, visit, um, visit in England and, 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 the, and the new website and so on? You, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of the listings, um, we would encourage businesses to put all that kind of detail um, into uh, their listing on, on, on the website. Uh, I think Adrian's got, Adrian had his hand up there as well. So he's, he's probably got a bit, bit more detail. Um, but what I would say is in terms of the sector deal that I mentioned earlier and the, and the tourism zone bids, um, accessibility is a huge part to play in that. So it's, it's something we really do need to get on top of. It's also an opportunity to, to, um, to pull away from the online travel agents because actually booking.com and the others, they're not doing this particularly well. So, so stay lists and, 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 and sort of the technology that uh, VEE has um, is embedded. Um, you know, Pete has, um, uh, we, we do when we onboard um, a, a customer, an accommodation onto that um, so that we can sell online uh, for, for VEE. Um, we ask those questions. So it is about getting that metadata. So you'd be able to search. Um, for, but, but of course, it's a giant task. Um, it hasn't been the thing that has been done over the last 20, 30 years. So, so there is an opportunity if you do have these facilities to stand up because um, there is a need. Um, and people are, are realizing that actually, um, you know, platforms like ours will be able to search on um, accessible sites and we will over time get better and better data. But we are relying on every one of you out there to give us that data when you are when you are going through your questionnaires and onboarding um, onto the, the, the platform. We need to know what those are, whether it's a handrail in a shower or step free access. Um, uh, it's really important. And it seems boring at the time. It seems as if it's a huge, long questionnaire of a thousand questions. The reason we ask these questions is so that we can categorize the search results. So bear with us in all of this sort of stuff. We're going to get better. It's an absolute commitment. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so as questions come in from Orsi, and I think this is something perhaps that James might want to pick up on, and I'm sure others will have a view from a sort of technology point. You know, it's a question about, you know, what, 
who are the best payment payment providers to use? And actually, James and I were talking about this on a on an event. Um, I think it was last week or the week before. I can't quite remember. Um, and talking about how you'd implemented um, technologies. I think there was there's, so there's a question about payment providers, but I think there's a broader question about how if you're going from a standing start, looking at any anywhere where you need to deploy some technology. You know, how do you go about choosing the right thing? You know, there's a bewildering array out there. We've talked about trust, but if you're starting from a Google search, um, you know, what, what are some sort of principles for this, James? Um, I think Adrian can kind of step in on some of the payment providers for accommodation businesses in particular um, and how InStyle connects with them. From our experience, uh, or from my experience with the Big Drop Shop, we connected through something called Stripe. Because the the the, uh, the the rates of uh, the charge rates are very clear and transparent, you know exactly what you're paying, and it's also very quick to set up as well. So if you if you're connecting an existing platform and wanting to take payments through that, Stripe's a great one to look at. Go Cardless is also great as well. That may need some additional technical assistance with it. In terms of finding the platform that suits your business, um, I think. The, the, the first thing to always look out for amongst the, the thousands of different things that are out there that can help you is to look for things that have the, the best onboarding support. So the, the support of getting the system set up and also the best customer support moving forward as well is that it, it's really important to really look after your customers if you're delivering a service to them. If you find yourself on a platform that doesn't, you find yourself wanting or you're not getting the replies uh, in a good period of time or they're not relevant or it's the wrong time of day that you're not sat there getting the results you need, you're probably looking at the wrong service. So you want to find something that you know is easy for you to use, but it's also for you, easy for you to ask a question and get pointed in the right direction for what you need to do. Yeah, if I can come in in there. Uh, thanks, James. Yeah. So, I mean, there are two levels of this. The problem with payment providers is it's not just about cost. Payment providers can cause huge friction in your conversion process. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to throw anybody under a bus, but some big providers are just not optimized for, for mobile. So you'll have the most perfectly mobile optimized um, flow. And then you'll bring in this big payment provider who you trust because everybody uses them. And then, boom, it doesn't work on mobile and, and you lose your customer. So you've got to look at, at how, how frictionless is the payment process. Is it embedded into mobile? That's the first thing. And then actually, once you've got your gateway and your, your provider, Stripe is wonderful because it's plug and play. It's frictionless. Um, we love it. Most of our clients um, will get up and running with them. And when, when the only time they'll, they'll start looking at is, is there are merchants out there if you're doing a lot. And if you've got a restaurant and you've got lots of card turnover, you may get a better rate. Um, with a merchant and um, you know there are there are lots of merchants out there specifically in and if you email me I'll let you know who I, I recommend um, but they are they're, they're much sharper cost wise than Stripe but then you've got to make sure that you've got a gateway that is offering Stripe's frictionless experience and you've got to plug those two in so actually weighing it all up it's probably just better and easier to go with Stripe because but, but if you're that price sensitive and you've got lots of volumes that you can benefit from then it's worth integrating a, a merchant with a really good payment gateway. But out of the box, Stripe all the way without a question. Tim, I'll just add to that in terms of it depends on your demographic or user type. And I put a message in the chat, but if you're targeting a younger generation, perhaps that Apple Pay to Google Wallet, those kind of things where, as Adrian quite rightly says, that kind of seamless mobile experience is really important. However, if you're targeting a slightly older demographic, then something with the trust and respect of a PayPal or something like that may be worth it despite the extra commission charges. Actually, that might just get them over the line. All we're trying to do really is get them from one part of the funnel to the other. So just make sure your payment gateway and acquirer helps the user to do that and doesn't put a barrier in the way. Completely agree. Thank you. Um, just, um, I know that Diane's posted a, 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 a question in Q&A uh, which I think is probably best answered, you know, in the uh, by the attendees of the event rather than the panel. Um, uh, and I'm just going to ask, you know, if you if you haven't seen that question, please have a look at it. I mean, I think the question is around uh, when North Norfolk District Council last year put on some heavily subsidised workshops on digital media and marketing. 
particularly for this sector, uh, there was low take up. And, and so given that we're hearing that there's high demand for that kind of information and, 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 and knowledge, um, if you want to kind of put something in the chat, uh, in, in, into the chat around, around that from your experience as a business, you know, why you, why you might not be taking up some of that uh, support. So is it uh, delivered in the right format? Is it, a is it a timing issue? Is it a, the length of the thing? Please do engage in the chat. I mean, I think we're, you know, we're now at the point where we're really kind of running into the, into the buffers of, 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 of lunchtime. So um, I'm, I'm really going to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap this conversation up unless I, you know, anyone from the panel has got any kind of key message based on what they've heard this morning, what they've seen in the chat. Something that they would like to say is just a takeaway for all the participants. Um, so if in no particular order, if anyone's got a takeaway, please um, feel free to say it. Talk to people and get advice on everything you do over the coming months, particularly if it's free. A, a five minute phone call can save you days and thousands of pounds. The only thing I'd say is that we have responsibility as business owners and tourism providers to take action and to make the difference. Sometimes it won't happen for you. So if you want to make change, stand up, get out, stop being part of the crowd, do something different and uh, make the change yourself and, and we'll all support you. Yeah, my only part, parting comment is um, go and have a look at the people who are doing this well and copy them <laughs> you know it's 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 the, the, these tools are these tools are all out there the, everything's commoditized it's democratized whatever the words are go and grab them because they're out there we're living in a wonderful time and if you just show a little bit of well, you know grit and, and determination you can learn and do it because you could it it really is all out there for you if you need a little bit of help we're all out here to help um, and other businesses are too so good luck and just community community spirit first i think it's an exciting time i don't Brian, know, I yeah. absolutely echo that uh, that's one thing we've found is if you need to do anything generally there's a tool out there to get you started even if you want to move from that tool to doing your own thing there's something out there to get you started on it so just being proactive and going out there and finding that and getting going is i think the best way forward Brian. yeah there's an awful lot of help out there for businesses but the biggest thing that I find in Norfolk, obviously I'm, I'm speaking about Norfolk, there's something involved in this, but what I find is the entrepreneurship within businesses and the keenness of their own business has dri driven Norfolk forward over the last 20, 30 years. So there is innovation out there already, otherwise we wouldn't have the 3.5 billion pound economy that we have. What we're doing here is trying to keep it and make sure that to keep it, go to the, the websites, go to the uh, that the, the LEP uh, and the Innovation Hub make sure that you keep your business operating throughout this pandemic and afterwards. We know you can do the things that you do anyway because you, you're great at doing it. Look at the economy you've created. Let's try just keeping that economy going. And that's a lot of what this is today, is keeping what we've already got going, but trying to give you the innovation to keep moving forward as well. So there's a lot of help out there for you. Use it. It's, it's there for you. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of help right now when you need it. Wonderful. Well, um, there I think we're going to have to leave the panel. I'd like to thank everybody on the panel. I think the message from Graham, which is kind of, we are innovative, keep innovating, sort of stay with it, and we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to achieve this recovery together is, is absolutely fantastic and a perfect note to end on. So I'd really just like to thank everybody who's joined this event, all you are, uh, attendees who've participated so actively in the chat, in the Q&A, in the polls, you made it really come alive. Um, and thank you also for so sharing tons of stuff on social with that hashtag tourism tech. Um, the, the, there will be a legacy from this event. And I think that was the last thing I wanted to end on. This isn't the end of the road. We are um, working with uh, our other partners, so with Norfolk County Council, with New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership, with Norfolk Chamber of Commerce. We fully intend at Tech East to do more of this. We're going to have some deep dive sessions as we go through the year. Uh, we're going to be uh, recruiting a diverse um, bunch of uh, speakers uh, from different businesses that you haven't heard from today, but perhaps we'll be going a little bit deeper in some of these technologies. We're hearing a lot of demand for 
digital marketing, for social media, for use of data. We're hearing surprising, likely great um, interest in artificial intelligence that can do for your business and then some other niche topics as well so we will be back with some deep dives we will be in touch with you all afterwards with links to the contents of the presentation and i think on that note i would simply like to again thank all our speakers so thank you james to nathan jason adrian pete callum graham thank you to uh the um organizing team um the my my uh my co-organizers um jen and bridget Thanks to our production team. And thank you all for coming and making Tourism and Tech a great success online. Uh, we're gonna sign off very shortly. Uh, if you need to leave now, goodbye. If you wanna leave a message in the chat um, function, please do. Um, and we will be sharing a lot of all the insights, all the questions and the answers to questions that haven't been answered uh, in due course. It might take us a few days to process that. But meanwhile, on behalf of us all, thank you very much. Thanks for attending Tourism Tech, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.